and she's crying for relief in the tears of melting glaciers in the dying of the reefs in drought and in famine in flood and hurricane the earth has a fever and she's crying out in pain it's not proving easy to do what's right but when our planet's dying we try with all our might when we look at the earth and we see property something has already died inside of us when we look at a forest and see timber something has already died within us when we look at waterways and think this is a great place to dump our poisonous waste something has already died in us and every religion in the world that deserves that name needs to call us back. We are actually having discussions about whether we can afford to save the planet. We are actually having discussions whether we can afford not to poison our own children. You know, in politics, we have people who speak for the poor. We have people who speak for children, speak people who speak for single women, battered women, uh, homeless. What would happen if we could actually interview water? What would it say about the mistreatment? What would air say about what it gives and what it gets in return? What would the land say and how we reap so much from it and yet we disrespect it? In conclusion, at the end of the day, let's ask ourselves, who is speaking for the creation who gives us so much? Peace be with you. Thank you. And these are words of warning, but also words of hope. The economist James Gustav Speth writes, we do indeed borrow the earth from our children. If only my generation could say that we are returning it to them, a better place than we found it. In truth, we have continued to purchase prosperity at an enormous cost to the natural world and to our human solidarity as well. I want to encourage people to slow down and sit down and listen to what nature has to offer, but also to reflect on the beauty of God's creation and the wonder of it all. We have been given a sacred gift by God and we are called to care for that gift not only for ourselves, but also for future generations. We need to be willing to experience God through reason, through science, technology, and innovation. Being a person of faith does not excuse us from using reason, nor does it excuse us from not being proactive in caring for the environment. In fact, as Muslims, it is implicit as our role of viceroys of the earth. And the true reality of all being is our interconnection, is our, is how actually how radical, how radically connected we are to everything else, completely dependent on everything else. About Moses who went up into the Mount Sinai. And he went up to Mount Sinai, and when he comes back down from the mountain, he raises his hand in blessing over the Israelites, and he said, the Lord bless you and keep you. My pastor used to do that every Sunday. And I'm wondering, how in the world does God keep me? What does he mean, keep me? Take care of me, I suppose. It means to help, the, to, for you to realize your very fullest potential, to be all that God created you to be, to magnify the, the resourcefulness of everything that God made. God wants that for us, and he wants us to want that for creation when we are told to keep the garden. When I think about the imperative to protect the environment, and especially when I think of climate change, I return to these words from the book of Deuteronomy, words that remind us that we are who we are and we are where we are because of the choices made by our ancestors and that we, in turn, by our choices, will help to determine what our descendants will inherit from us.
Those in the faith community believe in, a, in God the Creator, uh, and, God, and we believe that God loves the world. And so there's some assumptions there that God creates enough. It's a sustainable economy uh, if we nurture those relationships, if we um, make our choices in a way that, uh, that does not negatively impact anyone, human or non-human, this generation or all the generations to come. We see in nature something of the character of God, a God, first of all, of extravagance. When I look at nature and I snorkel out in the Caribbean and I see schools of fish and I see thousands of them, you have to wonder how many fish does the world need? God chose to give us lots of fish. When I look into the sky and I don't see a star or two, I see incredible a number of stars and an infinite galaxy that goes thousands of light years away. And I got to say, this tells me something of the character of God. I have an extravagant God. And then finally, these words from the activist Paul Hawken. Healing the wounds of the earth and its people does not require saintliness or a political party. Only gumption and persistence. It is not a liberal or conservative activity. It is a sacred act. It is a massive enterprise undertaken by ordinary citizens everywhere. Sisters and brothers, to be commissioned is to be sent on a mission supported and empowered by a community that is committed to your success. So here is your mission. To understand that you are borrowing the earth from your children. In your heart's imagination, see future generations of children looking back at you today and asking, what are you doing to leave us a healthy planetary home? Creator God, eternal spirit, inexhaustible mystery, your voice speaks all things into existence. The sound of your voice creates a place where we live in relationship with other friendly and frightening life forms, all of which you love and in whom you delight. You have created a place that we call home that is beautiful, yet it is fragile. A place that we should know in the most intimate way because we are made out of the same stuff that it is made of. Beautiful, fragile home called Earth. We're going to talk now about the climate disruption crisis. That's probably a better way to describe it than just say global warming or climate change or the other phrases that have been used because it is climate disruption. Um, the exact definition is that we have the ability and unfortunately we've been running an experiment with our Mother Earth and um, and we're beginning to find out that that was a bigger gamble than anybody knew. It wasn't because we were trying to. We didn't realize what was going on. We didn't think it was possible for humans to affect the earth. And yet now we know we have. The culprit in this case has a label. It's called greenhouse gas. And when you take a certain amount of uh, certain types of, of compounds with carbon, it will create a, it's like a warm blanket and, and it heats things up. So how serious is it? It's extremely serious. Because the earth that, that nourished the development of human civilization is not able to provide that kind of nourishment and protection and support as well now as it was, and it, the situation is getting worse. And we have to uh, deal with that before it gets to the point, it's the so-called tipping point, beyond which there is no return. I tell you, it's been a hard summer, bombs in the subway, water's too high, nothing makes sense here, some call Armageddon, some shut down in silence, scream at the sky.
see the lines on the faces of people pushed harder, 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 harder each day. Too tired to get angry or fight off injustice when there's dishes to wash and bills to get paid. And I feel like a trumpet a Salvation Army standing in snow and begging for change. People alive in this room are already seeing the effects of it. Young people who were born about 2000 and beyond will definitely see the effects of it. And if you have any grand grandchildren, they will be the ones that, that see the full result. So what we do in this generation determines not only what kind of life, but if there is a good life available for grandchildren, some of whom are already born. So if the problem is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, well, who's putting it there? So this is a, a nice chart that shows how much carbon per capita is being put in by the average citizens in the different countries around the world. <clears throat> you may recognize a couple of these. And again, this is per capita. This is not the total for the country because that's a function of how many people there are. Point of this is there are people around that can get by with a little less carbon uh, than we have. The species of wheats and corns and grains that we're growing today, they're, they have a pretty narrow bandwidth of where they feel comfortable in terms of uh, uh, temperature. And, and their fever, if we express the fever in crop yields, in the middle scenario, we'll, we'll already see a reduction of 20% in our yields of what we can grow on the ac current acreage. And it will go down uh, to 40% uh, in the two, three to four degrees uh, uh, scenario. And if we know we're already hungry uh, in lots of places of the world, it's going to get more and more and more difficult to feed the more and more people that we will be seeing in the next 50 years. Good news is, where are we going to get the energy if we don't get it from oil, gas, and coal? You may be asking yourself. Well, there is a uh, large object in the sky on some days. And if you just look at the amount of energy that comes in from the sun, it uh, dwarfs all of the other sources and all of the other reserves of all of the fossil fuels that we can possibly keep account of. I'm looking at the solar rooftop revolution, so now we're talking about hope, we're talking about the victory scenario and elements that are part of the victory scenario, how we can manage to deal with this. We're seeing that the installed capacity in time from 1995 to 2010, we're seeing the curves exponentially going up. And what we're also seeing is that the price is dropping. And what you see here is about 10 cents for the average electricity that you have to pay for when you get your energy from Austin. And what you see here is that the cost of batteries is going down. So you can drive more miles for the same amount of money. Um, and, and those miles are going up. And you see here in green the amount of electric vehicles that are being sold in America. Uh, installed capacity of LED light bulbs. You heard of those? So we switch from incandescents to CFLs and now we're moving to LEDs. Uh, wind energy, um, cheaper and easier to deploy on a large scale. Uh, drive to West Texas and you see what we're talking about. Um, installed capacity again and prices of installations going down. What we say is just exactly this. If we do this right, and we have every reason to do it, we will have enough that every family on Earth can have enough energy to provide a dignified and even a life with some joy. Every family on earth. We are the Interfaith Environmental Network of Austin, or IEN for short. The seeds of IEN were planted in February of 2008 when Texas Interfaith Power and Light brought together Austin's mayor and some 40 Austin area clergy and congregational leaders. That meeting at Congregation Beth Israel gave members of Austin's faith communities already involved in environmental stewardship the chance to get to know each other, learn from each other, and explore working together. This group received a charge from the mayor to lead on issues of environmental stewardship. And lead we have. As part of Texas Interfaith Power and Light, one of 40 state-level Interfaith Power and Light organizations, we have access to an ever-growing national support structure for our efforts. 
The IEN presents monthly symposiums to unite and encourage informed stewardship. The IEN Energy Action Team has also released a comprehensive manual that helps provide guidance for religious organizations seeking to take action to reduce their climate impact. Our manual, a free download designed to help awaken congregants to opportunities to reduce their carbon footprint, is entitled Becoming Carbon Positive. It has formed the foundation for climate stewardship success for a diverse range of Austin faith communities already. To date, with the help of our partners ClimateBuddies.org, Austin faith communities have eliminated more than one million pounds of greenhouse gas pollution from central Texas skies. Today, we invite you to join with other people in communities of faith as part of our Green Shepherds program so your congregation can reap the benefits of becoming carbon positive. By joining Green Shepherds, you help your community find its voice for the earth, affect real resource-saving change both at a congregational and individual level, and help protect and preserve our environment for generations to come. But we need to have your help here now. The whole purpose of this is to energize you, a little play on words, to go to work here now doing things that can be done uh, right now in your congregations, in your home, and you can see changes. You can measure it and you can see the effect and you're on the track to the victory scenario. So you are part of something very big but you are an essential part of it. And that's what the Green Shepherds program is all about. A way for congregations to foster a plan of action that is going to uh, work so they can work towards carbon neutrality. And whether it's through energy, energy efficiency measures, uh, through you know, re recycling in, in, their, in their congregation, and uh, also through the energy action team, the Green Shepherds program will have some resources. Uh, Youp and Bob, uh, the Climate Buddies, as a wonderful resource for the climate audits. So the Energy Action Team was going to provide mentors or helpers for those congregations who want to uh, accomplish some, go some energy efficient measures through the city perhaps that maybe they don't know quite how to navigate those waters. What we want to do is we want to encourage all of the congregations in their role as models of ecological responsibility. Right. So I'm with the Zen Center and uh, we have an environmental studies group and one of the things we did was with UP's help we completed a climate impact audit to assess our carbon footprint. And we do have solar panels. We started an energy action team. We're enlisting the congregants to become green neighbors one by one. Yes. So uh, our social justice team, two members, Kazel Morgan and Mike Ignatowski, are starting a climate change class. We kicked it off with a four-part series, sermon series, on keepers of the flame, water, air, and earth. So the minister gave us uh, all of a inspiring mandate to move forward. Then Yoop came out and uh, Bob and they gave a talk. So everybody understood what we were up against. And when we found out how much that little congregation was putting out in the way of carbon, 143 metric tons. And that woke us up because it brought it home that it wasn't just this abstract number there. <clears throat> so ever since then, we've been doing whatever we can, and what we've done is we've awakened the congregation through uh, doing a carbon diet uh, study group. So people lost, uh, some of them lost, or will within the year lo lose 5,000 pounds of carbon. So <laughs> it's quite a diet. We uh, wanted to get more people engaged and work with the neighborhood, so we did the walk to the park. And you can see uh, this. We had an archaeologist that showed what was happening just in the neighborhood, and also to look at the effects of climate change in uh, terms of the number of invasive species, the impact of floods that came through this park before they had the, uh, they restored it to its native habitat. But it was a wonderful way. It was led by the teenagers. And uh, so the naturalists taught the teenagers, then the te teenagers taught everybody else. 
one of the biggest emphases that we have is Earth Month. The entire month of April is is one that the church allows us to do a lot of things, and uh, we focus upon that. And we we teach classes. We do uh, have done last year, and we'll do this year a church wide picnic at Zilker Park because we feel like if people get outside and see God's beautiful world, they'll have more of an inclination to take care of it. Chris led us to become a green business leader in the city of Austin. We have just gotten this recognition in December. So we're very, very proud. It's an energy audit. So we're talking with you about coming out and doing that for us, and that's going to be a big, big thing in our future. We can take that tool of the climate audit and, and take it to our budgetary committee and to our business manager and to our pastor, and everyone at the upper tier will be able to see uh, just how the church budget relates to uh, carbon footprint, greenhouse gas production, that kind of thing, and we can start looking at ways we can chop down our, our footprint. Go to Central Presbyterian right over there. Uh, I want to talk about first about something that we're going to do, which is called LIMP 4.5. I don't know if anybody else is doing this. Imagine the earth divided equally among all of us. Each person would receive four and a half acres, 4.5 acres. Now imagine that everything you need must come from those 4.5 acres but it takes 22.3 acres to maintain the average American lifestyle. This year, we will be observing Lent in a new way that helps us as individuals to care for God's creation by taking steps towards using only our fair share of its resources. First of all, we have a green representative for our public affairs forum, which uh, almost every Sunday from noon to one o'clock. The second thing that we're doing on a regular basis are green movie nights. Yeah, we have a 12 kilowatt solar system. Uh, I think we were the first church in Austin. Also, we were the first church to ever have a certified wildlife habitat back in 2004. The mission statement for Interfaith Environmental Network is to inspire and assist Austin's religious communities to lead the effort to care for the earth and to transform ways of life that cause climate change. So do not be afraid to think differently, to challenge sacred cows, to be accused of being radical or unrealistic. Be open-minded and open-hearted, but stick to your convictions. A new future reality is seeking to emerge through you today. Your mission? To understand that your work demands your greatest courage and creativity. The most powerful spirit of gumption and persistence you can possibly muster. And now, understanding these realities, your mission is to commit yourselves to leading your spiritual communities in the sacred and earth healing work to become carbon positive. And know this, the Interfaith Environmental Network is committed to your success. We will support you in whatever way we can. Please draw upon our power and support. Know this, God, the creator and sustainer of the cosmos, the Holy One, the sacred mystery, the Dharma, the way, the great spirit, however it is, you understand and experience the divine, the holy, or the truth. This sacred reality is committed to your success. Please draw upon the spiritual power and support that is offering itself to you. Know this, the earth supports you. The sky, the soil, the air, the water, every single living creature supports you. Draw upon the power and support of the entire earth community. And finally, the children of the future support you. Though unborn, their deepest hope is that you succeed. Dying of the reefs. In 
drought and in famine, in flood and hurricane. The earth has a fever and she's crying out in pain. It's not proving easy to do what's right. But when our planet's dying, we try with all our might. So speak truth to power. Then scream it if you must The earth has a fever And the cure is up to us